If you own stock in a company, you might be able to actually place an agenda item on the ballot at that company's next annual shareholders meeting to be voted upon by the other shareholders. This is known as a shareholder proposal, and you, the person that submitted the shareholder proposal to a company, you would be known as a shareholder proponent today on Zippy Point. I'm Brock Romanek, I'm a big fan of you. Okay, I'm gonna to try to boil down what took me over 300 pages to write. That was my first legal treatise that I wrote over 20 years ago into less than 15 minutes in this vid guide. That doesn't mean I'm gonna rush through what I'm saying. I will take my time to make my remarks. Crickets. 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 I do have a love-hate relationship with this topic, which I explain in another vid guide, a link to which is beneath. One, what is the shareholder process in a nutshell? If you want to place a shareholder proposal on a company's ballot, you have to successfully navigate the procedural and substantive aspects of the SEC's shareholder proposal rule. You can actually learn about the rule by actually reading the rule. This is one of the few rules you can learn and understand by actually reading it. Rule 14A8 is written in plain English. It might be the only SEC rule written in plain English. It's nuts that they're not all written in plain English. See my separate vid guide about my wish list for the SEC. And you should also read all the staff legal booms that the Corp Fin staff, the SEC staff has put out over the years. They really flesh out this rule in piecemeal fashion. They're on the SEC's website and they typically come out annually in the fall ever since 2001. I say annually, but sometimes they skip a year or two. It really depends on whether there's been any developments that they find worth updating and how they newly interpreted the rule over the past year. Then there's a final source of regulatory guidance. These are in the form of no action requests and staff responses. Those are also on the SEC's website, at least since 2007, although they've been coming out forever. And the staff used to answer each no action request with a brief response in writing. They have now changed that practice, starting with the 2020 proxy season, so that most responses are oral. They only provide a written response if the staff feels like they need to get the word out about something. Reading the no action responses from the SEC staff is sort of like reading tea leaves. You have to really know this area to understand if there's some nuance, if something is novel about them, because the responses really do address the specific facts in the request. You really do need to read the incoming no action request to understand the response. So two requests may seem similar at a glance, but then there might be one fact, just one fact, that really distinguishes them for the staff and the staff made a different decision. Luckily, you can read law firm memos or watch my vid guides to learn when there's been a noteworthy development delivered by a no action letter response. You don't have to be one of the dozen or so people in the world that truly knows all the ins and outs of this crazy arcane area. That's become more popular in recent years. So the SEC staff acts as the referee in this process of determining whether a company can exclude a shareholder proposal from their ballot if Rule 14A8 permits it, and the SEC staff gives a response indicating it's okay for the company to exclude. A little bit more about that later. Two, who are the shareholder proponents? So before I dig into the nuances of Rule 14A8, let's talk about what happens in the real world. The shareholder proposal process is really the only area where the SEC gets pretty involved in what is considered a corporate governance area. The SEC has rules that require companies to make disclosure about their governance practices, but those rules don't dictate what the practices should be. But here in the shareholder proposal area, the shareholder proposal rule can really influence the direction of governance generally in this country. A good example is a 1951 shareholder proposal sent to Greyhound, Greyhound buses in an effort to desegregate the Greyhound buses. Ever since Rule 14A8 was adopted, its numbering was different way back then in 1942, it has been controversial. That's because proponents, that's the term of art for those that submit shareholder proposals, like I mentioned before, have used this process to effectuate governance change within companies and sometimes even far-reaching societal change. In, in recent years, there's typically about 700 shareholder proposals submitted to companies and about half of them actually go to a vote. Many proposals are actually withdrawn after the company reaches a settlement with the proponent that's permitted. Some are excluded because the proposals didn't meet the dictates of Rule 14A8, and the Corp Fin staff allowed their exclusion through that no action process. In recent years, about half of the proposals are ENS related, environment and social, and they tend to be submitted by institutional investors, 
or groups of institutional investors. And then the other half of the proposals are governance related. And these governance proposals tend to be submitted by a fairly small cottage industry of individuals who submit proposals year in and year out. Those proponents are well known to companies because they submit a lot of proposals. And then there's typically a half dozen proposals related to executive compensation, executive pay. So the folks that submit shareholder proposals are the ones that do this every year in most cases, and they really know the ins and outs of the shareholder proposal rule as well as anyone. Here's a chart from a Sullivan and Cromwell memo that illustrates how the three most prolific proponents and their families are responsible for submitting nearly one third of all proposals. Three, the procedural part of Rule 14A8. So the procedural aspects of the rule include one, a deadline for submitting the proposal to the company. That deadline often is disclosed in the company's prior year's proxy. See my separate vid guide about what companies disclose in their proxy about shareholder proposals, a link to which is beneath this video. But the deadline can't be less than 120 calendar days before the date that the prior year's proxy was delivered to shareholders. You have eligibility requirements, holding a certain amount of stock in a company for a certain amount of time. Overall, the bar is pretty low here, even though the SEC just raised a few months ago for the first time in quite a while what the thresholds are. And these new rule changes take effect next year in 2022. So starting in 2022, there are three alternative thresholds, continuous ownership of at least $2,000 worth of the company stock that is held for at least three years, continuous ownership of at least $15,000 worth of the stock for at least two years, and continuous ownership of at least $25,000 of the company stock for at least one year. Shareholder proponents have to prove and companies have to verify that the proponents meet their eligibility requirements. Seasoned proponents know how to do this. When they send in the proposal, they include it in their transmittal letter. They include the documentation for proof of ownership when they send in their shareholder proposal in the first place. If a proponent doesn't send in sufficient proof with the transmittal letter, Rule 14A8 has certain provisions that companies must meet in order to knock out that proposal, a specific time frame for companies to complain, to request proof, to put the proponent on notice that the submission was deficient. But companies need to do this before they can successfully argue to the SEC staff that the proposal should be excluded because the proponent failed this procedural requirement. Shareholder proponents have a restriction on them on how long their proposal can be, as well as the supporting statement that accompanies it. Together, they can only be 500 words. Each preposition counts 500 words. 500, 500 words. words. Since a successful shareholder proposal gets placed in the company's own document, the proxy statement, it's only fair that a shareholder doesn't muck up that proxy with something that is far too long. There's a requirement that you can only submit one shareholder proposal to a particular company in one year. That also means that you can't use alter egos to try to avoid the dictates of this requirement. And the SEC's new rules tighten this area up a bit so that a proponent can't act as a representative for another proponent at the same company's annual meeting if they have their own proposal at that same meeting. You have to appear at the annual meeting to present your proposal or send a representative to do so on your behalf. And the SEC's new rule changes took what was before more of an informal requirement through a staff legal bulletin and made it now part of the Rule 14A8 that there's a procedural safeguard where a representative of the proponent must have some sort of documentation proving that they are authorized to act on the proponent's behalf. I remember myself when I was in-house that a shoulder proponent hired a temp on the day of the annual meeting to show up at the meeting and present the proposal, a temp who knew nothing about anything <laughs> And just showed up with a with a script to read and oh geez. Yeah. Another one of the SEC's new rules, procedural safeguards, is that the proponent must state that they're available to do a phone call or meet in person between 10 to 30 calendar days after they submit their proposal to the company to discuss the proposal. And this might end up resulting in more proposals being settled and withdrawn. It's too early to tell. It doesn't take effect till 2022. Maybe the company can take some action that satisfies the proponent's desires. However, this just means that the proponent will be available, this new safeguard. It can't demand an actual call or meeting with the company. That doesn't have to take place unless the company wants it. Four, the substantive parts of Rule 14A8. So under Rule 14A8, there are 13 different bases upon which a company can argue that a proponent is out of bounds with their topic that's addressed in the shareholder proposal and thus the company can exclude it. A shareholder proposal can be about anything 
that their proponent wants. There are limitations. And some exclusion bases come into play more often than others, as you would expect. The ones you rarely see are these a basis, one or two proposals per year, perhaps. A proposal which would cause a violation of a law, which often overlaps with two other exclusion bases that rarely get play, that the proposal would violate state law and that the company lacks authority to implement the proposal that was submitted. Resubmission thresholds, that a prior proposal on the same topic at that company did not receive a sufficient level of support. The SEC's new rules do raise the thresholds here. Starting in 2022, a company may exclude a proposal if a similar proposal was last included in the proxy within the preceding three years. And as of the last time it was received, it either one had less than 5% support if it was proposed once within the last five years, two had less than 15% support if proposed twice within the last five years, or three had less than 25% support and proposed three or more times within the last five years. Other exclusion bases that aren't popular, that the proposal is not economically relevant or significant to the company, the proposal conflicts with the company proposal. It's a counter proposal. The proposal relates to specific amounts of dividends. You almost never see that anymore. The proposal is just a personal grievance that the proponent has with the company. You can't air your personal grievances through the 14AA process. And then these two exclusion bases aren't too popular, but they might draw about a half dozen successful arguments per year. One, that the proposal is substantially duplicative. I always have trouble with that word. Duplicative, duplicative, duplicative. The proposal duplicates a proposal to be included in the proxy. Usually that's management's own proposal. And then the other one relates to the election of directors. The exclusion base for false and misleading has a long history. It's typically about a battle over a few words or a phrase here or there rather than outright exclusion of the proposal altogether. It has to be a really crazy proposal to get excluded entirely as being false and misleading. In recent years, the Corpfin staff has been reluctant to play referees so much in this area anymore. It's a real pain for them, you can't imagine. So it's gotten harder to prove that something in the proposal is misleading. The staff usually allows it to go in. So here's an excerpt from a 2019 Morrison and Forster memo about what it takes these days for a company to win the false and misleading argument. So that leaves two exclusion bases where most of the action happens these days. One, that the company has substantially implemented the proposal, and two, that the proposal relates to ordinary business matters. For substantially implemented, an exclusion may be appropriate if the company's board has approved what it needs to approve to then place that on the ballot as a management proposal. In other words, the company can beat a proponent to the punch by placing its own version of the proponent's proposal, if it's substantially similar, on the ballot for the next annual meeting. The ordinary business base, I-7, has been the hotbed of controversy over the years. The idea is that you don't want shareholders to micromanage the company, not infringe on the company's routine, day-to-day -day stuff. Shareholders can't decide to just change the name of the company, for example, but that's an extreme example. The real action is where something that used to be considered micromanagement is declared by the SEC staff, the SEC, to now be considered a significant policy issue, and thus shareholder proposals in that area are no longer excludable as ordinary business. So this doesn't happen often, but it does happen, and when it does, it often makes the news because typically it's one of the hottest issues of the day for society as a whole. Lawsuits against the SEC may ensue, all that kind of thing. Five, the SEC staff's role. When a company receives a shareholder proposal, it can choose to include it in its proxy, even if it doesn't pass muster with the shareholder proposal rule. That's up to the company to include a shareholder proposal that it thinks doesn't meet the dictates of Rule 14A8. It can still include it if it wants. It doesn't have to go through the no action letter process, which can be time consuming, which can actually be a little bit expensive. You have to hire an outside law firm typically. If the company wants to fight its inclusion, it wants to fight for exclusion, it has to go through the whole no letter action process, which requires resources to do. Most companies decide to fight the proposal if they think they have a reasonable chance of obtaining a favorable response from the Corpfin staff. In recent years, the staff has granted favorable requests to companies allowing exclusion anywhere between 100 to 150 times per year. As for the staff, they do not relish being the referee. They do not like it. But there really doesn't seem to be an acceptable alternative for any of the parties involved. 
Rule 14A8 also has a bunch of timing and other requirements about the no action letter process to accomplish this. You really need to read the rule, the staff legal booms that I mentioned before, and really learn how this process works. The SEC staff has slammed processing a bunch of these requests in a narrow band of time since so many companies have a 1231 fiscal year end, so their annual meetings fall in April and May, so there's this whole proxy season thing. And the SEC staff will not hold your hand and walk you through the process. That just ain't going to happen. They don't have the time. They don't have the desire. If you don't get an answer from the SEC staff, there's an appeals process to kick it up the ladder at the SEC. But that rarely happens, but sometimes it does. And it's rarely successful when you do go up the ladder. The last thing I'll say is that in very few cases, very few things outside the norm might happen. A proponent might challenge a company in court to try to compel a company to include a proposal. Once a shareholder proposal lands in court, the SEC staff normally will stop processing a no action request relating to the proposal. They're going to let the judge handle it. A judge may well ignore the SEC's lore, the SEC staff's lore on a topic. First of all, because that's what can happen in court, particularly if a judge has scarce knowledge of the federal securities laws, right? They're not going to know this stuff like the SEC. The converse can also happen. A company goes to court to seek approval to exclude a proposal rather than go through the SEC staff's no action letter process. It's more costly to do this than the no action route and it can be hard to pull off due to the narrow time frame involved between the time a company receives a shareholder proposal and the time when it needs to file and deliver its proxy. But it does happen on occasion. The company just needs to send a notice to the SEC staff at the same time it files a complaint in court notifying the staff of its decision to go the judicial route. A company provides this simple notice in lieu of submitting a no-action letter request. Let me end by noting what no-action letters really are. They're merely statements that the Corpfin staff won't decide to refer the matter to the SEC's Division of Enforcement if the company excludes the proposal. It's nothing stronger than that, but proponents typically don't want to go to court. So in theory, a company could decide to on its own, exclude a proposal and take its chances that Corfin won't make a referral to enforcement, the SEC's enforcement, rather than go through the whole no action letter process. That exclusion without staff relief is a violation of Rule 14A8, which according to that rule is also a violation of Rule 14A9, the anti-fraud rule. So this hasn't been done to my knowledge. I've never heard of this being done. And let me know what you think.